So, how much did your mom leave you? Larry asked right after the funeral. I couldn't believe he said that without any sympathy. He probably thought I already had the inheritance because he saw me with the bank book, but he was totally wrong as a person. It's around two million dollars, I replied. Only two million dollars? That's all. Larry smirked in a way that made me uneasy. Even after taxes, there should still be hundreds of thousands left. I didn't like his reaction. His smirk gave me a bad feeling. I didn't know what he was up to, but I was sure it wouldn't work out for him. The next day, Larry rushed into action with his plan, but his shallow thinking was going to backfire. He just didn't realize it yet. My name is Sarah Taylor. I entered an arranged marriage at 19 with Larry, who works for a company. He's three years older than me and the eldest son in the Owen family. Despite being called the eldest, his younger brother Frank left home after university and hasn't kept in touch. This made Larry effectively the only child, cherished by his parents. Honestly, I didn't want to marry Larry but my family has a long-standing business background and I couldn't defy my parents' decision. Larry couldn't refuse either, given his family's business ties. Our marriage wasn't based on love, it was far from a happy union. Sadly, we couldn't conceive children. Marrying young, we struggled to accept this reality, hoping a child might improve things. Despite medical visits, it didn't happen. Hey, have you finished the chores, Sarah? Initially, my parents-in-law, who used to treat me well when I was young, started calling me Baron after a few years. Come on, you should be able to conceive if you just do what you're supposed to. Going to the hospital is a waste of money, my father-in-law would say mean things to me every day. But Larry never defended me. While they scolded me, he'd read the newspaper or nap, snoring loudly. When I wanted to work for a change, he'd say, if you work, people will think we're struggling, and kept me from leaving the house. Back then, it was normal for women to stay home after marriage. Living only with my mother-in-law was a nightmare. No one helped me. I couldn't worry my parents and leaving wasn't an option because of our marriage tied to work. I hoped things would improve someday and endured each day desperately. But even after many years, nothing changed. Nineteen years into our marriage, when I turned 43, my father-in-law died in an accident. It was then discovered his company had been avoiding taxes. The back taxes and fines wiped out our assets. We kept the house but lost our comfortable life when the company went bankrupt. I thought it would be tough for Larry, then 45, to find a new job, but my parents helped him get one. He quickly found work, but my mother-in-law became withdrawn and aged rapidly. For a while, she didn't have the energy to criticize me, which was a relief. Then she had a stroke and needed care. This dashed any lingering hope of having a child. At 43, I was already losing hope, but this marked a clear turning point. Larry naturally expected me to care for his mother. On his days off, he lounged around just like before. Larry, I wish you'd help with your mother sometimes, I finally gathered the courage to tell him one day. Even if it was just one meal on his day off, any help would mean a lot to me. But Larry frowned and replied, Ha! Huh, I ain't working, you know. Let me rest on my days off. Larry just didn't seem to grasp it. I never really had what you'd call a day off. After Larry's father's company went bankrupt, my parents started worrying about me. They finally said, come back home, but what would happen to his mother if I left? Now, we have a caretaker come once a week, but I can't imagine affording someone daily for this house. Despite being mistreated, I couldn't abandon her. It just wasn't in me. Eventually, Larry began leaving the house early even on his days off. He claimed he felt uneasy relaxing at home. I heard from neighbors that he started saying, my wife won't let me relax at home on my days off. He started taking trips alone, while the neighbors knew his mother needed care. Knowing this but pretending I handled all the caregiving showed he didn't care how others saw him. It was heartbreaking to see his mother, who adored Larry, being neglected by him once she fell ill. Sometimes she'd say, Larry won't come because you're here. But when I asked, should I leave then? she'd fall silent quickly. This continued for another 19 years until my mother-in-law passed away at 79, joining her husband. I was nearing 59 then. 
no longer loved Larry but I had accepted many things. Leaving wasn't an option, and I resigned myself to spending the rest of my days in this house. Larry remained dedicated only to his job, which was noticed. Even after retiring, he was asked to stay on as senior staff, which sustains my current lifestyle. We were never close, but I'm grateful for that. Despite our troubled marriage, Larry never tried to kick me out. Perhaps he feels it's too late now. He still prefers to be away from home on his days off, so I've learned to cherish my solitude. I've taken up pottery as a hobby and made friends in my later years, finally enjoying my days since getting married. But this seems to bother Larry. You're out enjoying yourself while I'm working, he complained. One day he even burned my bag. It was the bag I used for pottery class, and he burned it in the yard. What are you doing? Don't waste time on strange hobbies. Just focus on the housework, he scolded. My pottery materials and pouch were still inside the bag. Even pouring water on it came too late. It turned to ashes. I was furious. I thought change was too late, but I still had a long life ahead. The word divorce crossed my mind, but before I could consider it, another tragedy struck. My parents passed away suddenly. My father fell ill and died unexpectedly, followed by my mother a month later. It all happened so quickly, and I was overwhelmed with grief. My brother Jack had taken over our father's company, and with so many people at both funerals, I ended up bedridden for about a week afterward, likely from mental exhaustion. My pottery class friends kindly checked on me, but Larry mocked me, saying, How long are you going to sleep? I was tired after mom's funeral too, but I didn't sleep that much. Must be nice to sleep all day without working. While his point may have had some truth, as a husband's words to his wife, it was deeply hurtful. The next day, I pushed myself to resume my routine. With no luxury to enjoy hobbies anymore, life became a basic existence. Larry seemed content and indifferent to my feelings. Sometime after my mother's funeral, I remembered the payment deadline for the funeral home and checked the bank book. Jack was busy with work, so I had promised to make the payment on his behalf. However, Larry noticed me with the bank book and came over with a smirk. So, how much did your mother leave? I was shocked by his question right after my mother's funeral, with no concern for me. He must have assumed the inheritance was already in my account because he saw me holding the bank book, but that seemed too callous for someone. I replied flatly, about $2 million. Only $2 million, he scoffed, smirking unpleasantly. Well, even after taxes, there should still be hundreds of thousands. What a horrible smirk. I didn't understand Larry's intentions, but I knew things wouldn't go his way. Without a word to him, I quietly put away the bank book. Finally sensing the atmosphere, Larry spoke up. Well, you've been through a lot. You should get some rest tonight, Larry unexpectedly offered kind words. It was out of character for him, and instead of making me feel better, it made me feel uneasy. I didn't want to see him anymore, so I went to bed early that day. However, the next day brought an unexpected turn. After breakfast, Larry left for work as usual, but then I received a call saying he hadn't shown up. This had never happened before, and I grew worried about a possible accident. Frantically trying to reach him, I couldn't get through. Restlessly pacing around the house, I walked into the living room and found something on the table, a piece of paper. It was a divorce form already filled out by Larry. Seeing it, I thought, no way, and immediately checked where I had left the bank book the day before. As I suspected, it was gone. I couldn't believe it. Larry hadn't vanished accidentally, he had deliberately disappeared. I had sensed something was off in the living room that morning. Taking these items, he must have been planning to start a new life without me. He hadn't kicked me out earlier because he was waiting for my parents' inheritance. The missing bank book confirmed his intentions clearly enough. Even after realizing the truth, I stayed calm. There was no need to panic. I calmly filled out the divorce form and took it to the city office. Larry had brought this upon himself. I felt he needed to fully grasp that it was too late for any regrets. I called Larry's workplace and informed them, I haven't been able to reach him either, but it doesn't seem like an accident. I'll keep you updated once I hear from him. I apologize for any inconvenience. 
His workplace decided to treat it as a paid leave and wished him well, which made me somewhat envious of his good job. After all, it was a company my parents had introduced him to. I had hoped he would show loyalty to his work, but now he was becoming a stranger to me. I successfully submitted the divorce form. After enduring so much, it felt surprisingly easy to finally gain my freedom. I pondered how different my life might have been if I had divorced him earlier. As I packed my belongings, my phone rang. It was Larry, whom I had been ignoring after he didn't answer my calls. Anticipating what he might say, I continued packing. The calls persisted, even on the house phone. It was probably Larry, and his persistence annoyed me so much that I reluctantly decided to answer it. Hello, I answered casually. Larry's voice came through the line in a panic. Yes, I called because they told me you didn't show up for work. You need to contact your workplace right away. That's not the issue right now, Larry interrupted, shouting. I can't withdraw the money. Hearing his frantic tone, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. So, he finally noticed, huh? I thought to myself. He must not have realized because he hurriedly took the bank book. My ID, you burned it. What? No, don't you remember? It was in the bag I used for pottery class, I replied, still chuckling. Larry sounded flustered. Then this ID, isn't it expired? I wouldn't know about any of this after your mother passed away. I've asked you repeatedly to handle the paperwork. I went to the bank to sort it out, but they said I couldn't proceed because I'm not the heir. So the bank book was left untouched with just a few dollars remaining. Don't joke around. You should have handled things properly for someone who's no longer here, right? You kept saying you'd take care of it eventually, so take responsibility. Don't blame me. What am I supposed to do with this bank book then? Whether you do something or not, unless I handle the paperwork, nothing can be done about it, I replied, growing impatient as Larry continued to complain. It seemed Larry had returned to the bank teller, explaining the situation. I accidentally burned the ID, and it could be handled, maybe by proxy. Look, I'm on the phone with my wife right now. Speak louder, I could hear the teller's troubled voice too. I questioned his words. Larry, what are you talking about? You know you can't do anything like that, as a stranger, right? Ha, huh. the divorce papers were processed correctly just now. Thanks for handling it. Goodbye, I said firmly before hanging up the phone. I knew the bank teller could hear my final words as well. By now, Larry must have been either shocked or furious, maybe both. Just picturing his reaction made me chuckle. I knew I had to leave the house before he returned. With that in mind, I swiftly packed my belongings and left. My destination was my family's old home, now empty after my parents' passing. I had inherited that home as well. My mother's assets from her company totaled $15 million. However, inheriting a large sum of cash wouldn't be safe if Larry found out, especially since we had no children. So I inherited just enough to live comfortably, about $2 million. The rest included the family home, my mother's beautifully preserved dresses, and my father's antiques. If these heirlooms were a price, they would be quite valuable. My brother Jack approved of this arrangement. He had moved out after marrying and was concerned about the family home sitting empty. With children of his own and managing the company, he preferred inheriting the cash. We peacefully settled the inheritance arrangements. Upon arriving at the family home, I informed Jack about divorcing Larry and my decision to live there. If you're staying in the family home, at least it won't be empty, which is a relief. But are you sure about divorcing Larry, Sarah? Jack asked with concern. Yes, I replied firmly. We have no children, and both our parents have passed away. If we both agree on divorce, then it's the right decision. I want to start anew, and I have no regrets. Jack remained concerned about me being alone, but living as Larry's servant for the rest of my life would have been worse. Besides, spending my remaining years in a place filled with cherished family memories brought me happiness, even if I was alone. Larry continued calling me many times afterward, but he never thought I would be at the family home and never came to visit that day. I spent time in peace. The house was lonely without a family, but I felt relief from the bottom of my heart. The next day, I finally gathered the energy to go make a deposit. The bank book was with Larry, and it was a bit tiresome to retrieve it. 
I decided to go around 5 o'clock a.m., assuming Larry would be asleep. When I got home and opened the front door, the smell of alcohol hit me. Wow. I couldn't help but grimace at the smell. Entering the living room, I saw beer cans scattered all over. My bank book was torn and left on the table. This is terrible, tearing up someone's bank book like this, no matter how angry you are, is just wrong. I gathered up the pieces and put them in my bag. I also packed a few clothes and went back to my family home. Then I headed to the bank. As I approached the entrance, I heard someone call out, Sarah. It was Larry. He had been waiting for me. I noticed the bank book was gone, so I figured you'd come here. Whether I come here or not is none of your business, I said. Don't say that. We've been together for so long. Even though the divorce was finalized, he still talked like this. I ignored him and entered the bank. Larry kept trying to talk to me, but I firmly ignored him. That's when it happened. Brother, isn't that Sarah? Someone called out. Frank, why are you here? It was Larry's brother, Frank. Both Larry and I were surprised to see him. We hardly ever saw Frank, usually only at funerals. It had been about 43 years since I married Larry, and this was probably the third time I met Frank. He had wanted to cut ties with the family, but his parents, worried about their company's reputation, begged him to at least show up for important family events. Since we had met at my mother-in-law's funeral a few years ago, he probably recognized us. Ah, I'm here for the inheritance of Mum's estate. Thought I'd check the balance and then inform you too, Frank said. Larry's eyes lit up. I was surprised too. I thought there was just a few dollars left in the bank account, but according to Frank, there were also investment trusts set up a long time ago and safe deposit boxes rented during their father's lifetime. Frank had heard about it from his mother before she passed away. She had sent him a message saying, if anything happens, you take care of it. However, due to his busy life, it had taken him this long to act. Frank looked apologetically at me and Larry. There was a letter in the safety deposit box along with some jewelry. Mom said all her estate should go to Sarah, Frank said. I was surprised by Frank's words, but Larry looked even more shocked. Frank pulled out a letter from the documents he had with him. I recognized the stationery because I had bought it for my mother-in-law. The letter clearly stated that all the jewelry in the safety deposit box and other assets should go to me, her daughter-in-law, Sarah. I could picture my mother-in-law writing it carefully. I remembered asking her if she needed the letter, but she had coldly replied, it has nothing to do with you. Maybe she meant to write this letter at that time. I covered my mouth in surprise. Sarah, you've been taking care of everything on your own, right? Frank said, Despite the mean things my mother-in-law had said, she was sorry and wanted me to handle the estate. She knew that if she told Larry, he'd probably try to keep it quiet. Next to me, Larry's face turned red and he started trembling. Well, I never intended to inherit anything, but as the legal heir, I thought I had to handle it. It's just a matter of changing the name to Sarah, so that shouldn't be a problem for you, right? Larry said this casually, not knowing about our divorce. Later, I was called to the bank counter. Larry, without any purpose, just sat in the lobby. Lacking the energy to follow, that day I completed the rice once of the bank book and the transfer for the funeral home. I'm going ahead, Sarah. I'll contact you again, Frank said, leaving Larry and me behind in the bank. I safely returned home. Frank contacted me again later, explaining that Larry had protested, saying such a letter is invalid but Frank convinced him, saying, respect mom's wishes. However, unable to satisfy Larry, Frank visited a lawyer for free advice. Although the letter couldn't be recognized as an official will, the lawyer suggested that settling by discussion would be more cost-effective than hiring a lawyer. Larry agreed to the inheritance of the house. The investment trusts weren't worth much, and Larry reluctantly gave up on those and the jewelry. Thus, I formally received my mother-in-law's estate. If Sarah gets Mom's estate, I should get it for my mother-in-law, right? Larry argued with the lawyer, but that was a different matter. It was embarrassing. Even the lawyer scolded him. Larry couldn't accept it and finally tracked me down at the family home, showing up at my doorstep. I was wrong. Let's start over, he begged, realizing he couldn't get anything. He knelt at the doorstep, pleading for reconciliation. 
Start over. There was never any love between us to begin with. What's there to start over for? For the first time, I felt free to speak my mind. I shared my long-held feelings with Larry. He fell silent, seemingly regretting his actions for the first time, and I couldn't help but smile. At least you still have the house, right? Have you contacted your workplace? If you're so desperate for money, you better work hard and not lose your job. After saying that, I closed the door. It was finally over. The bank book held assets left by our mothers, and with this, I could surely live comfortably from now on. Larry, however, continued to be absent from work without informing his workplace, which led to his dismissal. I had warned him. Without even his passion for work, what was left for him? Maybe his hard work wasn't out of responsibility, but to maintain his dignity. Now, without anyone to show his dignity to and missing the easy money he thought he'd get, it wouldn't be surprising if he felt he had lost his purpose in life. Even though I was concerned for someone I had spent years with, that was it. I had no intention of helping him. I truly apologize for the trouble caused to you, Sarah. It's really regrettable, Frank said. He was the only one who apologized and told me I no longer needed to deal with Larry. Realizing the family's issues early on, Frank had left home young and was probably living happily now without involving himself in that home. Larry had become a recluse, but at his age, he could probably live on his pension. Wanting to start over showed he had some courage, at least, but he should try starting over on his own. I began attending pottery classes again, and my friends were delighted with my return. I hadn't realized how enjoyable it could be to spend time just for myself at the pottery class. I even met someone wonderful. Though I had sworn off marriage, being with someone who loves me might also be a form of happiness. Rather than being alone forever, it might be better to embrace new beginnings. It might feel too late, but just like with a divorce, it's never too late as long as you're alive. Anyone can find happiness, no matter their age. I believe that.